Wilt thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together? Hello and welcome back to Nibble Pop. This is Monami Mukherjee and here in this channel we are making videos for students of English literature of colleges and universities. We have been getting many requests from our subscribers and viewers that we should make some videos on the poems from the Romantic period. So here we are with a very important poem today, the landmark poem of the Romantic period which is very famously known as the Tintern Abbey by William Wordsworth. Don't skip anything in this video because we are going to look at the text, the context, the theme, the symbols and the ways in which Wordsworth communicates what he really feels about nature, about life, about religion and about humanity in this wonderful poem. I welcome all of you and I expect you to subscribe to us so that you get notified every time a new video comes up. When I was growing up, you know, in my school days, uh, we had poems by Wordsworth, especially poems like The Daffodils, The Solitary Reaper. Uh, you know, we started to have this impression that uh, Wordsworth is a very old person, who loves to look at natural objects, describes them. So we had this vague impression. And then when I went on uh, to study literature, then I started to understand the whole folly of my uh, initial understanding of Wordsworth. Many of you uh, who have not been initiated into the poetry of Wordsworth yet, who are, you know, you can say freshmen from the college or uh, maybe you are first year students. In that case, you uh, simply have this idea that Wordsworth, Shelley, uh, they belong to a class of people who were escapists, who loved to uh, travel among natural uh, ambience and you know, somehow you have this feeling that uh, these poems are simple poems. If you have uh, been through the video that I have made on the background of the Romantic period, then you have realized the gravity, the seriousness that Romantic poetry represents. I'm not going into a detailed biographical introduction to Wordsworth uh, or you know his uh, times because we have already covered that to a large extent. He was born in 1770. And it was before the French Revolution and we know that French Revolution acted as a trigger, you know, trigger which made people feel that uh, monarchy was not the absolute be all and end all of establishments, that uh, democracy was a possibility, that people should and could fight for their rights. Uh, they started to believe in concepts of equality, liberty. So, it kind of freed the European mind of age-old traditions and that happened in the year 1789. Now this French Revolution, this kind of had an impact on the thought of British people, uh, especially two persons, Wordsworth and Coleridge, who ended up publishing a book, a very important book, uh, which is called The Lyrical Ballads. Why was this book important? What was the central theme uh, that Wordsworth and Coleridge wanted to portray, wanted to represent? If you read this poem, Tintin Abbey, you understand the crux of their ideology, the crux of their, you can say the summary of what Wordsworth really wanted to communicate to us or rather to his readers through lyrical ballads in general. So we will read this poem not just to understand this poem, but it's like an introduction to uh, the whole idea that Wordsworth represents. We will have some discussion on uh, some of the philosophical concepts which we need to understand. But I will try to make it easy for you by reading the poem as we will go on with it and wherever needed, 
we will pause, we will take a break, we can just uh, come back a little bit and think about how that line, how that word is relevant, not just to understand Wordsworth, but to understand Romanticism and Romanticism as a, you can say, as an extension of some other previously existing thought or philosophical idea. All right, so enough introduction there. Let's talk about the title first. Although we are referring to this poem as Tintern Abbey, the whole title is different. You know, it's, it's a longer version and it was very common in those days to have long titles for your poem, poems and it's almost like you summarize your whole poem there. You, you talk about what the poem is about and what you're going to say in that. So you have some kind of guesses when you look at the whole title and it's called lines written a few miles above Tintern Abbey. There's a comma after that and then he says on revisiting the banks of the Y during a tour July 13, 1798. So that's a huge you know, almost prosaic title. Prosaic means it's not a very uh, clickbait kind of a title. You know what a clickbait is. Uh, uh, like when you uh, surf through the YouTube or Facebook, then uh, there are these very uh, attractive titles to videos. And they are so attractive, you want to click on them to see what it's about. But here you have a very flat title. You know, it's not very inspiring. It's like somebody is starting to write an essay. And that's very normal because or that's very expected because this is not going to be just a poem. It's more like a poetic essay. Okay, so there is an argument here. There's a logical sequence of, you know, you can say arguments which he makes, uh, points that he makes and then the counterpoints that he puts on and then he establishes a theory in front of us. So he chooses to be prosaic. Another thing that is very important about this poem is he is giving us a location here. So he's talking about Tintern Abbey as a geographical fixed location. We usually have this feeling that romanticism is about non-fixity. In a romantic poet, they talk about vague things, about remote locations which doesn't exist in this world. But he is talking about a place which actually exists and not just actually exists. It, he also gives the time when he goes there and the occasion like during a tour and then he uses the word revisiting the banks of the Y. Y is the river uh, which flows in front of the abbey. So he is giving us a fixed location, a fixed time, a fixed occasion and exactly a fixed date that is 13th July 1798 and probably this whole uh, thing about you know, fixing a place, a time, a location, an occasion, this whole thing robs the title of any mystery. And we usually associate romanticism with mystery and magic, right? It's like the Arabian night kind of mystery. Where is mystery here? Well, uh, for one thing, the word Tintin Abbey, is a very prosaic word, isn't it? It's abbey is like a church building, usually not a normal like cathedral or something. It's like a, a, it's a place where the monks, they used to gather, it's like the abbot, you can say uh, he used to be in charge of the people uh, who were taking up religious orders. And Tintin Abbey, during this year, you know, 1798, by this time, Tintin Abbey had turned into a ruin. So technically, it was not a place where Christians went to worship. It was a place, if you have a look at the picture, you would understand. It was a place uh, which was very much assimilated with the natural surroundings. So it was more like an extension of nature. So Tintan Abbey, it loses its connection with human civilization and becomes more connected with ambient nature. And if you uh, focus on the picture, you would notice how the whole building, which is again, uh, it's, it's in ruins, entirely covered with moss and greenery 
and it's surrounded by uh, mountains and there's a water body in front of it, the river Y. So although the title looks prosaic, without mystery, the place doesn't. It carries all the mysticism, all the mysteriousness of any medieval castle or any medieval structure uh, which used to be the setting for gothic novels later on. And this place was not uh, something that was worth, worth visiting for the first time. He uses the word revisiting which means he is talking about coming back. So he had been away and now he is coming back and he gives us what he feels the moment he is back here. All right. So we will just take up the text as it comes. Five years have passed, five summers with the length of five long winters. And again I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a sweet inland murmur. You notice that when we read this poem, we are not stopping uh, where the line ends. So we kind of uh, flow down to the next line. Because unless you do that, you won't have the whole sentence to think about or the proper pause where you need to stop. So if you just read it like this that you know five years have passed, five summers with the length of five long winters and again I hear these waters rolling from the mountain springs, it doesn't make sense. So he is writing a kind of poem which was very new. Why new? See you already know uh, I guess about Alexander Pope, he wrote in the 18th century. Okay, and then if you have gone through Gray's Elegy, uh, you know that heroic couplet or rhymed verse that was very popular during the 18th century, the, the period just before words were wrote. Okay, and then if you go back a little more to the point where you reach the blank verse of Milton, yes, there is no rhyme in Paradise Lost, but the kind of language that Milton was using, that was very heavy, you know, it was serious and heavy and you needed loads of guidebooks to go through, you know, word notes to go through the whole uh, text. Okay, so that was Paradise Lost and here you look at something which reads like normal conversation. It's like somebody is actually talking to you and this is what Wordsworth was talking about. He was talking about in, in the preface he clearly wrote. He's talking about poetry being something which is used to communicate. Poetry is not something uh, which should be difficult to understand. It should be something uh, which can be freely communicated to the reader or to the person who is listening to it. So when we go through these lines, we realize Wordsworth's idea of poetic diction, Wordsworth's idea of poetic language, that it should be a democratic one. And that was influenced by the French Revolution, equality, uh, for liberty, all those things. Okay, so let's come back to the poem. What is he saying? He's saying that five years have passed, which means the last time he has visited Tintern Abbey or this place, it was five years back. Okay, five summers with the length of five long winters. Okay, we know that five years means five summers plus five winters. Why is he uh, giving you them separately? Because when he uses the word winters, he is deliberately adding the adjective long because in England uh, winters are especially harsh and in summer time you have fun, you, it's, it's a nice weather. So you don't feel like it's a long summer like we feel in India. It's a long summer and the winter you know kind of just flips away especially when you're in a place like Bengal or um, uh, you know maybe South India. So winter is welcome here. But there, winter is something which they dread. Okay, it's a time which they want to go away. And that's why it feels so long. Okay, this also happens in Russia perhaps. Anyway, so he has come back to this place and he can hear once again the sound of the river, river Y. And how does he describe that? These waters rolling from their mountain springs with a sweet inland Murmur. Murmur is the sound, you know, soft, almost whisper like sound uh, that you make. And uh, 
uh, it's a human voice is associating with the waters. So somehow he feels that there is um, an element of life in the natural objects like the river and the mountain springs and their sound doesn't uh, appear to be uh, you know non-human. There is something human about the ways in which the water is making the sound here. Once again, do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs, cliffs means the mountain tops, which on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion. So the kind of uh, impact that these isolated mountain tops have on him is that he feels lonely, isolated and at the same time rich. It's not like he's feeling sad in his loneliness or in isolation, but somehow empowered, enriched. Okay, so it's seclusion. It's like he has been protected from crowd in a secure spot. It's his happy place. Okay, and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The day is come when I again repose here, repose his rest. So today, after five long years, he is able to rest once again here under this dark sycamore. So Kamur is a maple tree, it's you can, a biblical fig tree. So it's a shady tree, he can rest there and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at this season, now he's describing uh, the things which he sees around him and he, he talks about cottage ground, orchard tufts, which at this season with their unripe fruits among the woods and copses lose themselves. Copses are uh, thickets of small trees, you know, like bush-like structures. Um, somehow, this whole scene is seen from above. Uh, just go back to the title once again. Lines written a few miles above the internal. So, he's not like standing in front of the building. He is maybe on a valley, just on top, so that he can have, if not a bird's eye view, but at least a panoramic view, you know, from a distance. So he is looking at Tintern Abbey and the scenery around it from a distance. And the moment he looks at the whole structure of Tintern Abbey with those you know, cottages around with that mountain uh, background and the river in front of it, he is not just distancing himself from that structure, he is also going back in time. So here he does not only give us what he sees, but what he has seen five years back too. And somehow he tries to give us this idea that there's a continuity. It has stayed like this. It hasn't changed. Okay. And what other things is describing here? Among the woods and copses lose themselves. When he says lose themselves, it means that the boundary line uh, between uh, different trees, they are kind of blurred. It's like he's looking at a painting where the artist, he has deliberately blurred the uh, line of the horizon and mixed up the colors so that you have this impression of a whole instead of parts. So he's looking at this natural scene where he cannot distinguish between different parts and everything gives him a wholesome effect. It's like the whole thing together with the building which man has made is giving him the feeling that this in front of you is a block of nature. All right. And what else he sees? Nor with their green and simple hue disturb the wild green landscape. So the trees, their color uh, kind of blends in with the surroundings. So they are not disturbing anything. You know, visual disturbance is there. Once again, I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows. Hedgerows are, uh, you know, when people build these uh, natural boundaries between farms, between cottages, uh, made of small little shrubs. Those are called hedges. Uh, it's not like barbed wire. It's a, a boundary, green boundary. And he can 
see that the hedgerows, uh, they have grown uh, little lines of sportive wood run wild. So, it is not maintained, it is not curated by any careful gardener, uh, they are running wild. So, nature here looks uncorrupted, uncorrupted by human interference. Okay? These pastoral farms, green to the very door, it looks so natural that there is no demarcation, no area of separation between the cottages where human beings live and the land surrounding them. So, the green has kind of run up to their door it seems and there is a connection established between nature and what is man made that is the cottage of the man. Okay. So, this is a beautiful connection he uh, gives us through this expression green to the very door and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees. So, the landscape which he describes to us, it is not without human beings. There are dwellings, there are small cottages where men and women, they are living their lives and what kind of people sent up in silence from among the trees and the low copses coming from the trees with some uncertain notice as might seem of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods. So, normally woods or forests are not um, places where you build houses, but nomadic people, people who are maybe hermits, okay, uh, who have left this material world and gone off as a hermit or as a sage or simple uh, nomadic people, they live in small little temporary cottages in these woods and maybe they light a fire to cook food or to, to just keep themselves warm and from that fire the smoke escapes and that kind of merges with the clouds above. So, although those houses they represent human civilization but still these people being outside the community of civilization, you know, civilized people city life, urban life, these people who live in these small cottages, in these uh, inhospitable woods, they are as much part of nature as these trees, as these hedges. Okay. Or of some hermit's cave where by his fire the hermit sits alone. And maybe there is a hermit, a person, a meditative person, who has gone off in pursuit of truth, of religion, of finding out the sense of life, you know what hermits are. Uh, and when he talks about a hermit, he is talking about the concept of the noble savage in a way that when you are away from civilization, when you go inward, you know, seek truth inside you, not uh, in technology, not in machines, when you look at nature as a guiding force, you become a hermit, then you become like a philosophical leader. You give off a kind of knowledge that uh, the greatest teachers fail to do. And you do that in isolation. A hermit sits alone. He is away from everyone and in his loneliness, he reaches a kind of realization which Wordsworth wants for himself. So, he paints a picture in front of us in this first stanza and this whole picture is very descriptive. He gives us a lot of descriptors here and the best thing about descriptors that Wordsworth uses is that he employs kind of all five senses. All five senses are employed here. Uh, okay, he tells us what he sees. Steep lofty cliffs and then all this greenery, we have seen whatever he has seen. It's like we are seeing through his eyes. Then he tells us what he hears. See, I hear these waters, etc., etc. He gives us the idea of the kind of smell uh, he has, the smell of the unripe fruits, and then the feeling, the sensation of touch, where he is talking about the way in which landscape is touching the objects in it. So, he gives us 
uh, whatever physical beauty he can get from that scene to give us an idea what he is looking at, how he is feeling about this place. Now we come to the next part or the next stanza of the poem. These beauteous forms through a long absence have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye. He has given us some images from a scenery, right? And he is referring to them as beauteous forms. I mean, these mountains, this water body, uh, these cottages, this woods, everything is part of nature. And all these objects are beauteous forms to him. So what does he mean uh, when he uses the expression forms? Technically, we need to go back to Plato to understand what he means by forms here. One of the many theories that Plato put forward, especially in his Republic, there was this concept of the forms. He said that, you know, this world or our understanding of this world is divided into two aspects, images and forms. Images means everything that you see, touch, feel, experience with your five senses, everything that is tangible, you know, you can, you can simply uh, prove their existence, a table, a chair, a woman. But what about the things which you are sure exists, but you cannot pinpoint saying that this is this and this is that. You have all been in your um, primary classes and you know about different kinds of nouns, right? There is proper noun, common noun, collective noun, abstract noun, okay? Now, when you think about it, when you think about the idea of abstract noun, what are the examples you were taught? Honesty, truth, bravery, lie, things which you cannot experience with your five senses, but things which you can realize that they are there. Therefore, there is something in this existence which is outside the grasp of our five senses but still exists. These belong to the group of forms you can say. And forms mean things which do not change, do not change their quality. Abstract nouns turned into things which you can experience with your senses. For example, there is this word called beauty. You cannot objectify it. You cannot say that this is beauty. You can say this is a beautiful thing. This is a beautiful woman. This is a beautiful garden. So whenever we use abstract noun, as something which we can understand, perceive, experience, we use it as an adjective. Therefore, when a noun is qualified with an adjective, it becomes an image, something which you can experience in your life. And the moment you associate adjective with a noun, you also are associating a time reference. How? Suppose you say, she is a beautiful woman. This means that she is a beautiful woman now. In 20 years, you might not call her beautiful if your idea of beauty depends on her youth. If you say he is a truthful man, you are saying that he is truthful now. You are not certain, you are not guaranteeing that he will be speaking the truth like tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Therefore, the concept of things, anything which we experience with our five senses or the concept of images, they are transient. Transient means they are not permanent. 
You see something beautiful, the beauty will fade. You see something bright, it might get dimmed. You see something dark, it might get bright. So you are never certain that whatever you experience right now will be the same thing which you will experience later. But when you talk about abstract nouns, since they are not linked to any decaying object, changing object, they are existing as they are throughout. They don't change. Why? Where does beauty reside? Where is the idea of truth? Where is the idea of freedom? It is very much inside your minds. And when I say mind, I don't say your brains. It's your mind. It's your consciousness. Now come to this poem and look at what Wordsworth is saying. He has described to us in the first stanza a set of images. Remember images? But then he is saying that these are beauteous forms. This means that he is not considering these images as images. These are extension of nature with a capital N. And that nature is eternal. It does not change. That one particular tree, um, you know, might um, grow old, it might die. But this whole idea of trees, this whole idea of water, this whole idea of a ruined space, this idea is never going to change. And this idea is referred to as the beauteous forms. So when uh, you encounter questions like what does Wordsworth mean by beauteous forms, you just don't say that he's talking about the river, the valley, the mountains, the ruin of Tintern Abbey, uh, things which has affected him. Uh, no, he's not just talking about those things. He is talking about those things, but those things are an extension of his whole idea of nature. And how has this chunk of nature affected him? How has this beauteous form affected him? This is what he's going to tell us now. These beauteous forms through a long absence, he hasn't been for five years around this place, have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye. Now when a blind man looks at a landscape, he doesn't see anything, it doesn't affect him. So he says that these beauteous forms, these elements of nature, they have had an effect on me like something uh, which it has on a blind man. But oft in lonely rooms, so this is the effect he had. And amid the din of towns and cities, when he went away, he had been uh, to the city. It was claustrophobic for him. He felt suffocated. There was this... This littleness, the smallness of the rooms in which he had to live compared to this vast landscape which he was accustomed to. And he felt that his freedom was compromised. Now he's talking about those moments when this whole surroundings that he felt around him, that was choking him. And how does he write about that? Amid the din of towns and cities, the noise, I have owed to them. Owed to them means these beautiful, uh, you know, like snaps of nature. It's like he is taking photographs uh, in his memory. Okay. And those photographs, uh, imaginary photographs or imagined photographs, they were giving him a kind of relief. What kind of relief? I have owed to them in hours of weariness when I was tired. Sensations sweet. So the first thing that these beauteous forms gave him was a physical pleasure. He actually felt good. His body felt good. Okay. So he is first talking about the physical effect that his memories helped him get. Okay. Sensation sweet felt in the blood. Now, blood is directly connected to our bodies, right? It's part of our physical existence. And he's saying that he uh, felt a kind of a rush of happiness inside him. And he is very right because, you know, when do we feel happy? Biologists, they explain very well that uh, endorphins, a specific 
hormone which is also called happiness hormone they are responsible uh, when we are feeling happy it's like our brain is secreting endorphins and uh, we are relaxing uh, when we feel a lot of fear and anxiety it's adrenaline working uh, so our bodies define our emotions to a lot extent but he is saying that somehow these memories chunks of landscape stored in his brain they release that kind of hormonal reaction that runs through his blood so he felt happy when sitting in that claustrophobic place sitting in that uh, small little quarter he thought about this open space this happy place and he felt physically good so that was the first reaction he had and felt along the heart now just when his body warmed up to this idea of happiness it led automatically to an emotional state so physical is very much connected to emotional right if you are physically happy of course that leads to uh, you know a better mood a better spirit you have more energy to look forward to a day okay so your condition of the body determines the condition of your mind and that is what is happening here and passing even into my purer mind so he is making a difference between blood heart and purer mind blood is your physical body heart is your feelings feelings which any human being can have and then he is talking about the purer mind something which uh, coleridge might have defined as the secondary imagination you know something which makes you look at things in an elevated way or with a more open mind it makes you more spiritual so he is talking about like a chain reaction physical happiness emotional fulfillment and then spiritual awakening blood heart purer mind he gives you three categories in which he felt the awakening how was he awakened by these beauteous forms the memories of these beautiful images with tranquil restoration restore means when you are brought back to your original state when he went away from this place he experienced a life uh, which was very different from this rural life okay so uh, every day he felt that he was being broken down he was confined his soul was crushed in a city and when he thought about these moments he had spent that made him feel restored to his original state of happiness so it's like a process through which he is cured of a disease and what is the disease disease here is the life of a civilized society feelings too of unremembered pleasure such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life and how has this experience of visiting tintern abbey like when he used to do it 5 years back how has that affected him it has helped him become a better human being and how does he define a good man's life his little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love so you don't call yourself as having lived a great life if you have achieved a lot of worldly fame if you have achieved a lot of you know awards and stuff you have lived a good life if you have performed small little acts of happiness kindness love small little things where people don't even uh, you know tell you a thank you in return so if you have done things like that where uh, neither have you remembered that act not as the person you have uh, you know done that to has remembered it small little acts of kindness maybe helping a person cross the road an elderly man pick up something from the ground small little things which you might as well have not done if you are a person whose life is filled with things like that 
then at the end of it you will have a satisfied ending and what kind of a person does this what kind of a person has a great life where uh, that person has done these you know unlimited number of kind acts small little things a person who is influenced by nature because nature is all about this nature doesn't believe in uh, awarding something uh, to someone like human beings do because when you try to award somebody for some great act for some great invention for some great achievement you are also promoting the idea of competition when you award someone you do not give awards to a lot more people than you are awarding right so it's a process of negation nature doesn't negate anybody everyone who performs these small acts are rewarded and that reward is not in terms of any you know tangible physical reward that reward is felt within yourself you feel good about it and you feel at the end of your life that you have lived a good life and i think uh, when we are dying that's the only thing that would matter wouldn't it that uh, i had done what i could have done for everyone i had met or have met so that effect that nature has on human beings that is the subject matter of tintern abbey here okay so he is talking about first the physical reaction that nature has on him and how that physical reaction transforms into a spiritual experience then he talks about how uh, being close with nature has made him understand that the whole point of being a good man is being good in small little moments unremembered moments nor less i trust to them i may have owed another gift and not just the physical not just this teaching that he gets from nature teaching about how to become a good man the third thing that he gets from nature is of aspect more sublime the sublime means something which feels like out of the world anything can make you feel uh, what sublime is it depends it varies from person to person some person standing in front of an of a beach you know might feel the effect of sublime on him somebody uh, taking up uh, some kind of intoxication might feel sublime then so we don't know what has the effect of sublime on who but here we know that nature definitely has the effect of the sublime on wordsworth and what is sublime as i said when something takes you a little bit up it's like those meditating yoga gurus who elevate themselves from the uh, from the ground that kind of a feeling where you maybe are physically attached to the ground but your soul is elevated and you can look into things with better consciousness than people around you that is sublime and sublime has an element of mystery because there is no road map to sublime the road map which he he gives us a road map that go to tintern abbey come back go after 5 years you will feel sublime no it's not that he is saying that that has given him his personal sublime and when we talk about sublime and worse word we just don't say sublime we say egotistical sublime the sublime which is a personal experience for him ego is like your personal self getting elevated and he is at the center of his thoughts it's like almost the way in which people during the renaissance humanism phase thought you know homo centric world man at the center but for a romantic like wordsworth that would sound very proud if he said that i am at the center of my world no he is saying i am not at the center of my world i transformed by nature is at the center of the world which i think is the sublime world okay so i am not going to get into details because let's come back to it and understand what he says here he says that he has received three gifts first gift 
the physical effect of happiness okay or the, the physical happiness which he gets from thinking about the memories that is the first gift is talking about second gift is how nature has affected his actions his good actions small little things his kindness so that is the second effect third effect is the sublime and what is the sublime action that blessed mood so sublime equals to a mood okay elevated state in which the burden of the mystery in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened you know it, you reach a moment where you feel that all your questions are answered that is sublime and that is reachable in different ways in fact uh, later on maybe when we will take up poems like o to a nightingale we would know exactly what wordsworth was talking about here keats wanted to uh, gulp down some wine and simply reach the zone where the nightingale was singing he thought that it was possible to reach that level if he intoxicated himself coleridge he was um, an opium consumer and uh, he felt that that helped him reach that moment of sublime but moment of sublime if that was reachable simply by uh, consuming wine and intoxicants we would have had millions of coleridges and millions of keats by now right that becomes a trigger maybe but when somebody is capable of experiencing a sublime moment it means that that person has that in him that person like it's it's deeply ingrained in his psyche or her psyche and any kind of trigger makes that reaching point possible for them easier for them okay so he says that thinking about that happy moment that i had spent here thinking about that moment changed my mood into a sublime mood and uh, what happened then then this mystery that what, what is the final question that we have about life that what's the whole point of life why are we living what is love how do people look at me these are the basic questions we have these are the things which make life mysterious and in that moment of sublime you look into the life of things you start to get answers that serene and blessed mood is using the word blessed because it's a divine experience it's an experience which uh, the religious leaders they have also claimed to have experienced through meditation that they have reached god so that is a divine moment a blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on and it's a gentle process if it is an intoxicant the process is harsh it affects your body but if it's nature that is carrying you to that sublime mood then it will take you in a gentle way it's a more easy process easy for yourself until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended we are laid asleep in body it's talking about the state of meditation as stated by religious gurus throughout the world irrespective of religion i'm not talking about any one particular religion meditation is therefore not just a religious experience or rather it is the religious experience that he talks about because for wordsworth there is nothing higher than nature and because nature allows him to reach that sublimity that state of serenity therefore nature is like god for wordsworth because what is god if not somebody who takes you to that level where you know everything about everything and nature does that for him we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy we see into the life of things if this 
be but a vain belief. Maybe, maybe he thinks people will be laughing at him. But no, this cannot be true. It's, yeah, it, if you take a pinch of opium, maybe you will uh, get carried off to a zone where you will feel like sublime. But thinking about nature, how can that be? And he says, it happens for me. Yet, oh, how often darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight, joyless daylight. Usually we say that daylight is joyful. But when that daylight peeps through that shady window in a London room, it appears joyless. So in those moments, when the fretful star unprofitable and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart, how oft in spirit have I turned to thee, O Sylvan Why? Why? The river is called Sylvan. The word Sylvan, it means wooded uh, and it's right from the word Sylvanus. The Roman god of woods and the fields, like Pan god, okay, that is Sylvan. So the river Y is kind of personified in a way as if the river can hear him speak out to it. And the river is wandering through the woods and is almost seen as a, a deified form, as a figure of a goddess here. Okay, so he's talking about Sylvan Y. Thou wanderer through the woods, how often has my spirit turned to thee? To thee means to the images I had collected in my mind looking at you when I was here five years back. So he is talking to the river. And now with gleams of half extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint, when you go to a place, uh, you revisit a place, you tend to have recollections from past, but those recollections are never very clear. You know, they kind of uh, interpose with each other. Uh, some of the memories fade into other memories. And you have these flashes of deja vu, as if you have been to this thing, you have done that. Okay, so that happens and memory plays tricks on you. So naturally, he had forgotten many things, but even then, some moments are stored in his mind, moments which are overlapping, interfusing with each other and having an effect of a collage, as it were, when he comes back to it. And somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. Why sad? Because whenever we think about the past, we get sad. Why do we get sad? First, because life doesn't give us a chance to actually go back in time because if we could do that, we could become younger. Now, you all are very young people. You might not have that urge to go back yet. You are just enjoying your uh, newfound youth and you feel that this is the moment I've been looking forward to. But then at the end of it, uh, when you are troubled by your uh, honors uh, syllabus, then you do want to go back to the time when you didn't have to worry so much about uh, exams and uh, English syllabus at least, right? And trust me, when you'll reach my age, you could kill to go back to the time when, uh, say, you were first struggling with interneting. So he's talking about a sad confusion, sad perplexity that thinking about the past gives us always because the past shows us in a light where we only try to remember the good things. Unless and until there is a huge trauma in your life, usually your past always looks rosier than it was when you were living that life. And naturally, it becomes sad because you feel nostalgic. And nostalgia means yearning for the past. Oh, if I could go back to that moment, that feeling is associated with melancholy, not depression. Melancholy means a kind of sadness which is very poetic, very creative even. So it's not like memory of why is just restoring him to a happy state or a sublime state. It is also giving him a kind of poetic melancholy. And uh, what happens then? While here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, it's a pleasure for him, 
to remember uh, when he was here before. But not just that. He is not just happy because he is thinking about the time when he was here before. But he is happy because of something else. And what is that? But with pleasing thoughts that in this moment, there is life and food for future years. Five years back when I was standing here, that memory helped me survive these five years. Today I am standing here again. So it's like I am taking some reinforcements inside my mind. I am adding to that storehouse of memory so that again I can live off of it for five years, ten years, fifteen years. So nature is like, uh, you know, that well where you come, you drink and you then you live off of that. If you have read Harry Potter, it's like that elixir of life which you get from that sorcerer's stone, that philosopher's stone and you drink that and you survive and you become immortal until you drink, you have to drink again. So it gives you kind of a booster vaccine kind of a thing, okay, where you get immune to the horrors of civilized life, the din and hustle of city life and that memory needs to be recharged for what's worth. It's like a process of recharging himself and this is one of those moments. He knows that this moment is going to be useful in the future years. Okay, And so I dare to hope, though changed no doubt from what I was when first I came among these hills, when I was here earlier. Now when was he writing this? He was writing that he was born in 1770 and he was writing this in 1798. So figure it out. He's not that old. He's like what? 28 years old. And he's talking about a time when he was 23 years old. So from 23 to 28, it's like a huge leap. He has as if completely changed. Then he was a very young and mature man when he was 23. And if you are making your calculations, what was the year when Wordsworth was 23 years old? It was 1793. So a man who was turning 18 and there was this French Revolution and he was in this pristine landscape. He was getting aware of the words of Rousseau talking about the savage uh, power of nature, the concept of the noble savage. That man at 23, he was experiencing nature with all his body, with his whole physical existence. Because at 23, what, you all are what? Like, uh, your age is probably, you know, if I'm giving a right guess, it's uh, something around 20 to 22, at the most 23. So how would you experience nature? If you go on a hiking trip or if you go to a sea beach, you will enjoy nature. You will take a dive straight into the, uh, the sea water, run across the fields with your friends because that is the way in which a 23-year-old person experiences nature and he is talking about that. That back then, I had a different way in which I experienced this scenery. Well, like a roe, roe is a deer, a small deer, young deer. So he compares himself to a young deer and a young deer doesn't know where it is going. It simply leaps and jumps about. That is the way he experienced this place before. When first I came among these hills, when like a roe I bounded over the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved for nature then. Back then, how was nature for him? The coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by. So it was more like instinctive reaction. He enjoyed nature, of course he did. But that enjoyment was on that physical level. And we know that the three levels he's ta already talked about, physical, emotional and spiritual. He experienced nature physically, instinctively, like an animal. To me was all in all. I cannot paint what then I was. I was different. I cannot tell you what I was. 
The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion. Passion is a word you associate with your body, with your hormones. And at 23, of course, hormones define your actions. That is the most youthful phase of a man's life. The tall rock, the mountain and the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms were then to me an appetite. Something you want to feel, experience with your body. A feeling and a love that had no need of a remoter charm. There was nothing spiritual about it. It was all body. It was all uh, maybe a little bit of emotion but mostly body. No need of a remoter charm by thought supplied. I did not think about what I was looking at. There was no thought involved. Nor any interest unborrowed from the eye. Whatever I could see with my eyes, I was happy with that. I did not think about anything unborrowed from the eye, which is not connected to what I was seeing. I wasn't interested in that. That was five years back. That time is past and all its aching joys are now no more. I don't experience nature like that anymore. Aching joy, it's like an oxymoron, like aching means painful, but not painful. Aching is that, is a dull pain, uh, which is almost pleasurable if you think it that way. You know, when you uh, do a big workout, okay, and your body aches, it gives you a sense of fulfillment, like you have done something good for yourself. That is aching. So aching pleasure because he was experiencing nature with his body. So it was like an aching pleasure for him. That is not what he is doing right now. Now he is experiencing nature in a different way. That time is past and all its aching joys are now no more. And all its dizzy raptures, dizzy is something where that it's like a kind of intoxicated state okay it's like uh, you're so happy you don't have any care about anything that's dizzy it's like you're getting high so he was getting high on nature when he was young not for this faint eye nor more nor murmur i'm not sad that i'm not able to feel those aching pleasures anymore i'm not sad that i don't run around anymore why? Because I am experiencing nature in a different way now. And he says, other gifts have followed for such loss. What loss? The loss of being able to enjoy nature physically. We used to do that when he was 23 years old. For such loss, I would believe abundant recompense. Enough compensation is there. I have been given enough recompense. Okay. What compensation? For I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, not in the way I used to be when I was 23, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity. He has come to realize that sadness is not something you must run away from. You can experience it. Because you see, nostalgia, sadness, melancholy, all these things are so necessary to understand life and to understand humanity. You cannot escape everything. And people call romantics escapists. Yes. But here we don't see escape. He is talking about experiencing sadness. He doesn't want to run away from it. Nor harsh nor grating. He doesn't say that the sadness that he experiences is harsh. It's not cruel. It's not hurting him. I remember a statement made by Sharachandra Chattopadhyay and uh, I'm just uh, translating his words here. Now, forgive me if that translation is awful. But he said that pain, when removed from fear, can be enjoyed as much as pleasure. It means that pain is... When you, when, you, when you associate pain with terror, when you're experiencing pain because somebody you love has died or maybe you are hurt, wounded. No, he's not talking about that pain. He is talking about the sadness, the melancholy, which doesn't have any element of terror in it. That pain is as enjoyable as happiness and more sublime 
And that is exactly what Wordsworth is talking about here too. Though of ample power to chasten and subdue, and I have felt, so that, that kind of feeling makes a person change himself. Chasten means when you, when you rebuke somebody, when you instruct somebody, I don't do this, uh, do that. That is disciplining somebody. If you read the Lucy poems, you would see what I'm talking about. That Lucy is an imaginary person uh, who was nature's child. And Wordsworth imagines that nature disciplined Lucy, instructed her to be her child through the process of a transformation. And this transformation is like nature is a teacher for Lucy. Nature has been a teacher for Wordsworth. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts. Sublime is not peaceful. It's not nirvana. It's disturbing. Because when you see uh, the problems which you're having in life, when you, when you find the answers, you see that the answers lead to more questions perhaps. And it's disturbing because you have to think all over again. The whole point of opening your mind is to reach a point where you see that it can be opened further again. Okay, so there's no end to it. And it's disturbing, of course. Disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime. He's repeatedly using this word sublime, okay? Of something far more deeply interfused, who's dwelling. What is he talking about? Nature, I mean, these few scenes or things which he has seen around this Tintern Abbey, this ruin, not just that. He's talking about nature in general and he gives us some specifics. Whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man. This is where Wordsworth is not just a poet of nature, he's a poet of man. He is seeing man not as an aberration, not as, um, as an outsider. He is seeing man as an integral part of nature, if that man allows himself to be. So he is mentioning individual images, setting suns, round ocean. But he is talking about the non-changeable, permanent form called nature. You see, Tintern Abbey, this structure, was made by man. Once it was a very thriving structure, you know, it was very gorgeous and people used to be there. And then it got ruined over time. Time has this effect on everything that man has made, except the nature which grows around the Tintern Abbey. And only that part of Tintern Abbey has survived which has allowed itself to be associated with nature. Because we all belong to that world of images, sadly, yes. It's no way that like, we can reach that world of forms, of ideas. But in the moments when we become one with nature, we can experience a little of that world, which Plato would have called the world of ideas. The idea of freedom, the idea of perfection. So setting sun, living air, mind of man, everything becomes an extension of nature for Wordsworth here. A motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought and rolls through all things. He's talking about a divine spirit here as if there's a consciousness, as if a mango tree and a mountain and a river and a human being are all connected by some natural energy, spirit running through all. Okay, so that's a very unique idea. And of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear. So he's talking about the physical world here. That whatever we see with our eyes, whatever we hear with our ears, they belong to the physical world. Both what they half create and what perceive. Why half create? Whenever we look at something, any object, even in nature, we only see half of what is there. 
we don't see the spiritual aspect of it. This is again Platonic, you know, Plato said that the objects around us, they are all imperfect copies of ideas. The images which we see around us, they are imperfect copies. They are half created. They are not whole. You get the idea of their permanent beauty, permanent truth. Then you feel that, okay, I've seen it all. Well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts. He thinks that that spirit which lives beyond any dimension that we can see, that spirit is the guide. So he is not talking about Jesus Christ here. He is not talking about any institutionalized religion here. He is talking about nature and his religion is often described as pantheism. I like to describe the word pan in two ways. One, yes, the Greek god Pan. He was the god of the forest and of nature in general. So, Pan, Dionysus, whichever you call. Uh, and whoever is a follower of Pan thinks that the world of nature is the world of God and, uh, well, uh, they are pantheists. Fine, that's a very, that's a very uh, nice way of putting it. But another way, if you look at the word Pan, it means all. You know, panoramic view means an all-pervading view. Pantheism means the wholeness of everything that you experience. You believe that there is divinity in everything, including human beings. That is another way of looking at pantheism. And I believe Wordsworth is more like a second type of pantheist. Not just a pantheist who says that the tree is God or the river is God. He doesn't say that. He says that the same divinity touches the why which touches the ruin of the abbey, which touches the mountains and which touches his soul. So he is as much the part of divinity, so it's a pantheism, it's an all-pervading God being everywhere. The guardian of my heart and soul and all my moral being, not perchance if I were not thus thought, should I the more suffer my genial spirits to decay if I was not taught by nature? When I was young, maybe I would have become a depressed man by now, turned to decay. For thou art with me now, he is talking about the second person who is standing there with him. So this man is not alone. So this is not a soliloquy here. He is not talking to himself. He is actually talking to another person. It's more like a dramatic monologue. But... I would say a poetic monologue because we don't have any dramatic moment here. It's more like an autobiographical outpouring to a listener who is very sympathetic and who is in tune with the poet. Now, who is this listener? Who is standing with him here? For thou art with me here upon the banks of this fair river, thou my dearest friend, my dear, dear friend, is talking about his sister here. He's calling her a friend because she was very close to him, although she was quite younger. And in thy voice, I catch the language of my former heart. Since you are a young person compared to me, you are my past image. So he sees his sister as if she represents everything he was once. Okay. Just like you people represent was I was once. So in the same way he says this. And read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes. So he doesn't have the wildness in him anymore. He has become subdued now, mature. But his sister still has that youthful wildness because she is young. Oh, yet a little while may I behold in thee what I was once, my dear, dear sister. And this prayer I make. Finally, he gives us why is he writing this poem at all? Why is he talking to her here? Knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her. It is her privilege through all the years of this our life to lead from joy to joy. So nature, as I was telling you, gives us those points of charging up our spiritual batteries from time to time. It takes us from joy to joy. That is what nature does. It never betrays the heart that loves her. Uh, it's very interesting how 
is referring to nature as a woman. So he is seeing nature as God and God as woman. And that is a kind of a different way of looking at divinity. And somehow it is very non-Christian too. Because according to Christian theology, God is a very super powerful male figure, of course. So he is taking away that masculinity from nature, from the idea of divinity rather, because he makes nature not just look creative and feminine, but he's actually referring to nature as her and she. For she can so inform the mind that is within us, so impress with quietness and beauty, and so feed with lofty thoughts and neither evil tongues. How does nature protect us? Nature fills us with lofty ideas, lofty thoughts, high thoughts, so that when people hate us, people tell us rude things, when bad things happen to us, those memories of nature, those lofty thoughts, they help us survive. Now he's talking about the wrong things that can happen to his sister and the name of his sister is Dorothy. Dorothy Worsworth, she was very close, not just to Worsworth, but to Coleridge as well. And these three people, you know, Worsworth, Coleridge, Dorothy, they used to have this lovely chats together, long walks together. And that was like a very good bond of friendship we have there, which over time broke down. And that was a sad thing too. But here, let's come back to what he's talking about here. What are the evil things that can happen in life? Evil tongues, rash judgments, sneers of selfish men, nor greetings where no kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life. So these are the things that's going to, that are going to hurt you, shall ever prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith, that all which we behold is full of blessings. If we are equipped with the weapons, of restoration that nature gives us, then we are prepared to fight every battle of life, okay? That we can see everything as a blessing. Therefore, let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk, and let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee. So he's kind of giving a blessing to his sister, that let nature embrace you. And in after years, so later when you will come back, like I have come back today, you will also come back someday and then you will be a more mature person. In after years, when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure, when thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms. So by that time, you uh, must have grown ideas about this world of forms, wiser mature. Thy memory be as a dwelling place for all sweet sounds and harmonies. Oh, then if solitude or fear or pain or grief should be thy portion, if you are ever, ever broken down in life, with what healing thoughts of tender joy will thou remember me? Maybe in those moments when you're sad, you will remember me because this memory of this, this moment is going to charge you up with life again, okay? And these my exhortations, nor perchance, if I should be where I no more can hear thy voice. He's, he's just 28, but he's talking about uh, some distant future when maybe he would be away, he would be dead, and his sister will be all alone, nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence. I won't be able to be with you then, maybe I would be dead. Wilt thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together? Will you forget this moment? This is very important because nature is important, fine, because nature will restore you. But nature cannot restore you unless you remember. So maybe it's nature which is very powerful. But it is powerful only when you choose to exercise its power or you choose to exercise your memory. So he thinks that whatever immortality nature can give him is not through nature but through the memory of Dorothy. Only if his sister remembers this moment will he 
be remembered even after his death. And of course, it's like uh, you know uh, Shakespeare's words that so long as uh, men can breathe and eyes can see, that kind of line keeps on recurring. That I'm writing this poem, so long as this poem will be read, I will be remembered. So I don't know what is more permanent, nature or uh, this poem. I don't know who made whom immortal uh, because. Um, in my experience, people now go to see Tintin Abbey more than they did during the time of Wordsworth. So I don't know how much Tintin Abbey, the place, has immortalized Wordsworth, but I definitely know that Wordsworth has immortalized Tintin Abbey. So it's also the other way around. So human effort, human memory, human documentation is important. So, Wordsworth's nature is not powerful unless it is associated with goodness of man. Wilt thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together? And that I, so long a worshipper of nature, hither came unwearied in that service. The word service is very important. Service does not only mean offering some uh, religious prayers or some rituals, not that. You are serving. And how do you think Wordsworth is serving nature here? Apart from being a poet, he was uh, an activist, one of the first environmentalists. I had talked about that uh, in that video on Romantic Age. He was striving consciously, deliberately and violently against this massive industrialization, especially expansion of railways in these areas of the Lake District. And he felt that he had a responsibility to serve nature. Nature might be powerful, but nature needs service as well. And he is unwearied in that service and he wants his sister to remember that. Rather say with warmer love, oh, with far deeper zeal of holier love. He is constantly using these religious terms, you know, service and worshipper and holy. So these are the words he is deliberately using because he is a pantheist at the end of it. Nor will thou then forget that after many wanderings, many years of absence, these steep woods and lofty cliffs and this green pastoral landscape wed to me more dear both for themselves and for thy sake. What does he want his sister to remember? What are his last words? Is he saying that nature is all important to him? Is he saying this, that? No, he is saying that nature is important for me. I have come back like five years. And I'm looking at the scenery with a lot of love and veneration. But these things, these glimpses are important to me, not just for their sake, but because I am with you. So finally, the last words, they focus on human relationships. So he might have uh, romanticized a hermit's life here solitary hermit, uh, ideal world, that all fine, but that's not for him. For him, the memory inside his sister's mind is the place where he's going to survive everything. That is something he's aiming for. So he is a romantic because he knows that finally everything perfect exists in the world of ideas and his relationship with his sister, it will survive all odds only if she remembers him in this moment because in this moment he is acting as the best person. So these are the different ways in which uh, you look at the poem. Uh, many questions uh, come from this but mostly uh, teachers prefer to ask questions like uh, how uh, do you think nature has uh, gifted what's worth, what gifts has he received and you have questions like uh, analyze this poem as a poem of nature and what's worth as a poet of nature. Don't give flat answers there. Try to talk about how he is connecting human emotions, uh, human element, extension of nature that like human beings as an extended 
aspect of nature, an integral part of nature. How he is focusing on the concept of noble savage, the concept of the rural human life uh, as a contrast to the congested city life. Okay, so all these things will be useful. Um, please comment uh, whatever you have in mind about uh, something which I might have missed, any expression you want me to explain over again. And also, uh, you can uh, send me some of the suggestions about poems by Wordsworth, which you want me to take up. And in due course of time, we will be covering um, a lot more poems from the Romantic period, poems by Shelley, Keats, uh, Coleridge, of course. So keep sending your suggestions and we will see which suggestions um, we can take up first. Thank you for being with me. It had been a long video, I know, but I wanted to cover the whole poem and all its aspects uh, in this single uh, video. And see you all very soon in the next video next week. So till then, stay subscribed, stay happy. This is Munami Mukherjee signing off. Bye-bye.